And uh, Pastor Jack is supposed to be preaching tonight. And um, we came to a mutual understanding, I guess. He said, do you want to? And I said, yes, I do. Um, so this is um, second kick at the can, second crack at the bat, revival. Because the word revive means to restore, renew, return, reform, to rally, to refresh, to recharge. The word revive means to reinvigorate or reintroduce. It means to reanimate or regenerate, to repair, to reactivate. The word revive means to rouse, resupply, rejuvenate, revitalize, resuscitate, rehabilitate, replenish, refill, recover, reawaken, reestablish, rekindle, and even resurrect. Revive comes from a Latin word, revivere, which means to live again, again to live. Now the noun revival, as I said this morning, it doesn't appear at all in the King James Version Bible, not in the English translation that we have. But the verb revive occurs eight times, and the verb revived occurs six times, and the verb reviving occurs two times, and that's probably appropriate because revival is not a passive word. It's an action word. It's an active word. Our English term is from that Latin phrase, and it literally means to live again or to resuscitate a life which had almost expired. If you pull somebody that's drowning from a pond and you lay them out on the shore and somebody gives them artificial uh, respiration, and as soon as they begin to breathe, somebody says, they will revive. That's revival. Revival is to rekindle again into flame, a spark that had nearly extinguished. And so, of course, although the English Bible doesn't have the actual word revival in it, that concept occurs many times in Scripture. In the Old Testament, revive is translated from the Hebrew word hayah, which means live or alive, life or save, revive, recover, quicken. In the New Testament, revive is translated from the Greek word anazo, which means recover life, live again, stir into flame. And I said this morning, and I want to repeat it tonight before we jump in, that only something that once possessed life can be revived. You can't revive something that was never alive. So our sinful culture cannot experience revival. But if the church ever experiences revival, then a sinful culture can be impacted. Sinners can't experience revival. They've never lived spiritually. But saints can experience revival. And many sinners can be affected with the cause of the gospel. Transgressors can't experience revival. But travailers can. There's something so powerful that happens when people who are called by his name and filled with his spirit when they go to prayer and they mean business, when they go to worship and they're not fooling around. It's not casual. It's not easy. It's not soft or quiet. It's just powerful. And when Zion travails and when the saints pray and when the church is revived, then and only then does our world get affected. They don't get hungry for God until we get hungry for God. But the flip side of that coin is true. When we we get hungry for God, we'll see many of them get hungry for God. Revival is both the prayer and the promise of the Psalms because when revival happens, everything changes. Here's the prayer. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? You see, the psalmist was always concerned about having revival, not in his kingdom, not in the secular pagan nations around him, but he wanted revival not in his throne room, but in his heart. He wanted revival not in his army, but right inside his own spirit. And so that's his prayer. God, won't you just revive us again that your people may rejoice. I like what I saw. I like what I felt. I like what we experienced tonight with people 
people walking around and praising God and lifting up the name of Jesus because revival brings joy. People rejoice when there's revival. If there's no revival, they sit like a bump on a log and wait for the Pentecostal program to get over. But when there's revival, there's something that just gets stirring in the hearts of people and it changes everything. So there's a prayer for revival in the Psalms, but there's also God's promise in the Psalms. And here it is. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. That's the promise of revival. That even if you're in the worst situation you've ever been in, if your circumstances are upside down and your life is difficult, if everything seems to be going against you and some enemies have declared that they're going to do you in, the Bible says, in a promise thou wilt revive me God you're going to stretch forth your hands and when you do my enemies days are numbered when you stretch forth your hand sickness their days are numbered when you stretch forth your hand all of the things that the devil has tried to do against me his days are numbered you're going to save me Ephesus was an incredibly powerful and wealthy city in the ancient world of Paul's time It had marble streets and mosaic sidewalks and a massive, massive temple to the goddess Diana. It was considered one of the wonders of the ancient world. Ephesus had a busy port and a popular athletic arena. It had one of the finest libraries of the first century. It had villas filled with artwork and tapestry, silks and exotic birds and animals. It was magnificent. Even today, this restored Colosseum at Ephesus is considered one of the finest performing arts centers in the world. The acoustics are perfect. It was into this influential city of a half million people that the Apostle Paul brought the gospel and planted a church 2,000 years ago. He worked in Ephesus longer than he worked anywhere else. Acts 19 tells us that he stayed for nearly three years. It was in Ephesus that Paul found the disciples of John and asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost? since you believed. It was in Ephesus where people took cloths that had touched Paul's body and they took those cloths to the sick and the demon possessed and God did mighty miracles of deliverance. It was in Ephesus where seven presumptuous sons of Siva were addressed and attacked by an evil spirit who looked at them trying to parade around and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? It was in Ephesus where those who practiced witchcraft were powerfully converted and they amassed all their sorcery books and they piled them in a big pile in the city square and they set fire to all of those witchcraft books in one mighty sweep of revival. 50,000 pieces of silver was the value of all of those books. It was in Ephesus where Paul's preaching caused so many people to turn from the pagan worship of the goddess Diana that some of the idol makers who made their living off that false religion, they instigated a riot that engulfed the whole city. And it was in Ephesus where a regional revival happened, where the name of Jesus was magnified and where the word of God prevailed. It was one more powerful church. Later in his ministry, as Paul was preparing to head back to Jerusalem, he actually called the elders of Ephesus to to travel from, from the city and to meet him in another town, Miletus. And he met with the elders of the Ephesian church and he exhorted them in Acts chapter 20. We have the account. He said, you need to be careful. Even though you've got a great church, even though we've had an incredible revival, even though God's done wonderful things and we're thrilled about it, you need to be vigilant. Because there will be inevitable opposition. Has anybody here been living for God long enough that you know that the devil doesn't like you very much anymore? Anybody been living for God long enough to walk through a few valleys and have to scale a few mountains and you've been through some situations that were pretty dark? Well, see, that's what happens to churches too. It's not enough just to be a good church 10 years ago. It's not enough just to be a revival church of heritage. It's not enough to just have a good service that we can remember from last fall. But we have to be vigilant because there will be inevitable opposition that comes against the church. And Paul warns them, 
The opposition's going to come from outside and the opposition's going to come from inside. And he says to those elders in Miletus, the elders that have traveled to meet him from Ephesus, he said, wherefore I take you to record this day. I am pure from the blood of all men. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. You know it's important to be part of a church that declares all the counsel of God and doesn't toss out some pages of the Bible that we don't like. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. I don't want to get stuck here, but he says, feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. There's a lot of very critical people when it comes to the church, but like Pilate, I'd like to stand here and say, when I look at the church of Jesus Christ, I find no fault in the church because the church is the only thing God ever had to buy. When he wanted a whale, when he wanted a tree, when he wanted a mountain, a river, a stream, a pool, a pond, all God God had to do was speak it and it was done but what you're seated in tonight not this building but this spiritual entity this cost God something this cost heaven everything it was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ and so I don't have any complaints about the church I don't have any criticism of the church I know it's not perfect because it's got us in it I know that it's filled with humanity and humanity is frail and feeble and fragile but the other other thing that makes up this church is the mighty power and presence of almighty God and it's worth overlooking a few foibles of humanity to just have the glory of God in our midst so I stand here and say I'm thrilled to be part of the church that was purchased with the blood of God and I'm so glad that's true because it's his blood that can save you. It's his blood that can deliver you. It's his blood that can heal you. It's his blood that can break every shackle of addiction and bondage, of depression and fear. This is the church that was purchased with the blood of God. <laughs> I knew I might get stuck there. I find no fault in the church. I find no fault in the Lord of the church. I'm just glad to be here because I don't deserve to be here. I'm not worthy enough to be here, not righteous enough to be here, not holy enough to be here, not good enough to be here, but Jesus makes me holy and righteous and he makes me worthy. I am accepted in the beloved and I'm glad to be here. Hmm. Paul warns the church, the elders of Ephesus, the elders that have the oversight of this great church. And he says, I just got to tell you something. That's good news, but here's the bad news. I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Paul said there's going to be opposition and attack from outside and from inside. Therefore, watch. Keep your guard up. And remember that by the space of three years I stayed and lived in this city and I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul warns them to guard against grievous wolves that would attack the church with false doctrine. Some of these teachings would come from the surrounding culture and its false religions. But other teachings that were equally false would arise from within the church itself as people with big egos and small convictions would try to draw away disciples after themselves and not after the message that they had received. And so Paul says, watch. Watch outside and watch inside. And remember, I warned you. And the modern politically correct mind would say, wait just a minute, isn't Paul being just a little judgmental and pharisaical and harsh here? Why is Paul making such a big deal about doctrine? And isn't this name calling a bit much? Grievous wolves, really? Absolutely not. 
Because Paul got his attitude from the teachings of Jesus who talked about a faithless and perverse generation in Matthew 17, 17. And it was Jesus himself who identified false prophets as ravening wolves in Matthew 7. He said their lives bear no fruit and they will be cast into the fire. So Jesus said, and Paul reiterated, that what you believe is serious business and true doctrine is serious business. And for a few years, because of that warning, no doubt, all goes well in Ephesus. Eventually, that church grows to become one massive force in that metropolitan city. It's really a first century mega church. And Paul eventually, according to 1 Timothy chapter 1, he asks his young protege, Timothy, to go to Ephesus and stay there and oversee the church. Tradition tells us that Timothy became the pastor and eventually became the bishop of that church and that the apostle John actually spent his last few years in Ephesus and it may be there that he wrote some of his books. And we also know a lot about this powerful church, this great church, this awesome church. We know a lot of it because Paul wrote to this congregation a letter which you and I know as the book of Ephesians. Look how great this church is. Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but your fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That's one awesome church. First of all, they've got a strong doctrinal foundation, but you know what else I like? They've got strangers and foreigners. They've got people from different cultures and backgrounds coming into that mighty mega church in Ephesus and they're becoming one body and one family. They're becoming one church together. It's a powerful church. In chapter 3, Paul writes and he says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. I like a couple of things about that little passage. First of all, Jesus gets all the credit. Jesus gets all the glory. Jesus gets all the praise. And Jesus gets all the worship. We can't bring in an evangelist powerful enough to heal your body, but we might be able to bring a preacher to this pulpit who can preach the word of God and we can pray a prayer and Jesus can walk these aisles by the power of his spirit and it won't be an evangelist or a pastor that heals you or delivers you. It won't be a saint in this congregation that lifts you up from where you've been living but it'll be Jesus who reaches down so far you can't imagine and lifts people up so far that you can't even begin to believe it. And Paul said, if you think that's the end of it, let me tell you something. Jesus is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you've asked him and above all that you've ever dreamed about. I wish somebody in this room would take a little quick break in the middle of this sermon and I wish you'd lift up your hands and if there's anything you're believing God for, I wish you'd open your eyes and realize God can do more than what you're believing. I wish you'd get a hold of a dream that you have in your heart for your family, for your health, for your for your future. I wish you'd get a hold of that and realize that God can do more than you've even thought about. He can do more than you've even dreamed about. He can do more than you've asked him about repeatedly. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all of that. He's able to give this church a bigger revival than what we built for. He's able to give us a bigger revival than what we've strategized for. He's able to give us a bigger revival than what we've planned for. Unto him be all the praise and the glory because he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all. Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 4 he says there's one body and there's one spirit even as ye are called in one hope of your calling one Lord one faith one baptism one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all you imagine 
sometimes we get a little criticized because we're called the oneness Pentecostals. And there's some people that have a problem with that. If this isn't oneness, I don't know where in the world you'd go in the Bible to find oneness. That's a oneness passage. But you know what? Paul said it's not just a doctrine that there's one body and one spirit and one hope and one Lord and one faith and one baptism and one God. It's not just a doctrine. He's above all and he's through all and he's in you all if the oneness of God has never touched down in your life and made you know there's only one God worth giving your life to you don't really believe oneness if oneness hasn't touched down in your life and made you know there's only one thing that's worth giving your energy your time your talent and your treasure to you're not really a oneness believer but I thank God that the oneness of God isn't just out there in the ether waves somewhere the oneness of God is in here because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us and it quickens our mortal body. So we are one with him and he's one with us and we're one with each other. Paul writes to the Ephesians in this same chapter. What a powerful church. He said, here's the leadership you have. He gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. And can I just stop and say, they're all important. I thank God for the evangelists that come by. I thank God for our missionaries. Many of them function as apostles, taking the gospel where it's never been preached. We had the extreme honor last Thursday of having the funeral service for an apostle to the nation of Brazil, Benny DeMerchant. What an incredible man. I'm so grateful for his legacy. We've had apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, and they are for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ some people see a five-fold ministry and they have a three-fold job description and that's just not true the five-fold ministry have one job description they are to perfect or mature or fulfill or instruct or complete the saints and then the saints are to do the work of the ministry and they are to edify and grow of the body of Christ and so God sends us leaders and God sends us ministries and then it's our job to get a hold of the vision and get a hold of the passion and get a hold of the direction and then figure out what we can do in our one and only life to make it matter for the kingdom of God I've said it before for we are all able ministers of the New Testament everybody in here if you're full of the Holy Ghost God has something for you to do in his kingdom kingdom. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, your life matters. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, you can pray a prayer that results in a miracle. You can pray a prayer that results in deliverance. You can pray a prayer that results in God touching down and doing something incredible in somebody's life. Your job is not to call the pastor and get him to minister. Your job is to be an able minister of the New Testament. Is there anybody here that believes what Paul wrote to Ephesus? Because I believe We're the same kind of a church. There are ministries in this pew that if you could see what God does through some of them, you would be astounded. And they don't blow a trumpet and we don't pull them up on the platform and advertise it, but God is using them to build his kingdom in the city of Fredericton and the province of New Brunswick. Paul said, we're going to edify the body of Christ. We're all going to work at it together until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. And we grow up unto a perfect, a complete man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Can I just say one more thing before we move on? I'm not your measuring stick. Pastor Jack's not your measuring stick. You're not my measuring stick. And nobody else in this building is your measuring stick. Jesus is how you measure yourself. They that compare themselves among themselves are not wise, the Bible says. I've only got one person I'm trying to be like, and it's Jesus Christ. I've got one person that I'm trying to measure up to, and it's Jesus Christ, and I've got a mighty long way to go to be like him. i got lots of work to do right here. I don't have time to harass you over what you might not be doing. I just want to be like Jesus. Paul says to this great church in chapter 6, and we'll move on. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Somebody say fight. We, We got this thing way too 
passive and easy and calm and sedate in the 21st century. This is not some kind of little rec room. This is a battlefield and you have to fight sometimes and you have to put on the armor of God and you have to stand against the cunning of the devil. Paul said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Look at your neighbor say, it's not you. Especially if it's your wife or your husband, look at them and say, it's not you. Because it's not them. You're not fighting against flesh and blood. Here's what we're fighting. We're fighting against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And you want to know why we get a little enthused and excited and a little loud and emotional when we come to church? We're in the middle of a battlefield. Battlefields are not sterile and calm. Battlefields are intense and they're full of action. And every once in a while, somebody needs to stand up and chase the devil out of your life and chase the devil out of your mind and chase the devil out of your home. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And every once in a while, some little Pentecostal that might look about that high next to the devil, they can stand up to him because it's like David and Goliath. You come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. So devil, look out. I might be this tiny, but I'm coming for you and you're going to fall not because of my name, but because of the name of Jesus. So every once in a while, church needs to look like this and church needs to feel like this and church needs to act like this because we're in a war. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all. Say, I did all I can do. Well, there's just one more thing on the list. Having done all to stand. But pastor, I'm so tired. Just stand. Pastor, I don't have any more strength. Just stand. Pastor, the enemy's been beating on me all week. Just stand. Sometimes the greatest accomplishment you can have at the end of a week is to say, devil, you tried to knock me down, take me out, beat me back, but devil, I'm still standing by the grace of God. And that might not be all that much, but it's enough. I'm still here. I wish somebody get a hold of that and tell the devil and announce to hell and anybody near to you, I'm still here. It's by the grace of God. I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere, devil. I am still here. I am still standing. There's nothing you can do about it. My marriage may have caved in, but I'm still standing. My kids may have walked out, but I'm still standing. My finances may have collapsed, but I'm still standing. My health may be precarious, but I am still standing by the grace of God. Oh, I wish you'd turn that into a great praise and lift it up. I am standing. It is not by my strength. It is by his strength. It is by his name. It is by his blood. It is by his spirit. It is by his power. Devil, I'm still here. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. The devil tried to take some of you out. The devil tried to knock some of you down. The devil has tried to attack our church. He's tried to attack our families. He's tried to attack our kids. But you know what, devil? You're still working frantically, but we're still here, and we're not going anywhere. Now that, brothers and sisters is one powerful church, the church in Ephesus. When the book of Revelation is written, many years later, Ephesus is the only church in the New Testament that receives both an epistle from Paul and a mention from John. And when you read the mention from John in his writing, at the end of the first century, so much is still good and strong and wonderful in that church. They're still fighting evil. They're still fighting false prophets. They're still fighting false doctrine. They're still standing strong. 
in the middle of hard trials and they're still continuing to labor for the Lord in building his kingdom. When you look at Ephesus, there's absolutely no problem with their persistence, no problem with their purity, no problem with their diligence or their doctrine. They are an amazing church. They have a regional impact and everything looks wonderful on the surface. Revelation chapter 2, under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works. They're awesome. I know your patience, your labor. It's great. Your patience. It's amazing. I know how you cannot bear them which are evil. You've tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and you found them to be liars. You stood for the truth when other people caved in. And you have borne, and you have patience, and for my name's sake you have labored, and you have not fainted. You're still standing, even though all the power of the Roman Empire has been arrayed against you, and the devil and hell itself has fought you. You're still standing. There's just one little problem in God's eyes. These precious, godly, wonderful saints in this powerful, incredible region impacting church they have heart trouble they're very busy living and working for Jesus but they have left their first love they are doing the right things but not always for the right reason what is first love it's the honeymoon love of a husband and wife it's the excited, fervent, uninhibited, unashamed devotion to the Lord that always characterizes the witness and the worship of every new believer. That's first love. But if we're not careful, if we don't keep guard and keep watch, one day that very same husband and wife look at each other over stacks of bills and realize they've been so busy making a living they haven't had time to make a life. And one day that new convert wakes up to find that he's moved from the front pew to the back pew, from the altar to the foyer, from prayer meeting and Bible study to a thousand other commitments that have stolen his time and treasure away from the Lord. They have left their first love. And God takes that very seriously. In spite of all the good, in spite of all the amazing things that Ephesus is doing, God says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now, emotionally, you think that pastor just finished the best part of the sermon, and we're heading into the worst part of the sermon. But spiritually, pastor's heading into the best part of the sermon right now. God gives three instructions to Ephesus. Remember how your relationship with God used to be. Somebody say, remember. remember. Secondly, repent of your distractions and your deadness. Somebody say, repent. repent. And then finally he says, and you need to repeat the good works you used to do. Somebody say, repeat. repeat. And so this is what John says to Ephesus. He said, you need to remember how it used to be. Don't you use that stupid, idiotic cop out. Well, I've just matured. You haven't matured. You've died. Well, I just got older and wiser. No, you got colder and dumber. There is no special point given. There is no special uh, credence given to people that shrivel up and die. That's not looked upon positively in Scripture. Unless you think I'm taking a pot shot at somebody who doesn't respond emotionally the same as somebody else, that's not true. I'm not that dumb. There are some senior saints in this building that when they go to crying or when they go to travailing, heaven moves and this church moves. And there are others that their worship is a little more demonstrative and that's wonderful too. And we don't judge each other for that. But for heaven's sake and for your sake and for God's sake, there should be some kind of a response to the manifest moving presence of an almighty holy God when we get in his presence. There has to be something if you're filled with his spirit and then his spirit starts moving. There has to be something. And so Paul said, or John says, remember how it used to be and repent of all of your deadness 
and go back and repeat what you used to do. Some of you, it would be good for you to take a trip back down memory lane. We don't live in the past, I know that. But we thank God for the past. We don't worship our heritage, I know that. But we thank God for our heritage. And we don't need to get so sophisticated in 2017 that we forget what started this church out in 1961. We don't need to get that sophisticated. We don't need to forget all night prayer meetings and we don't need to forget little crowded buildings that weren't very nice and had no technology. But you know what? Technology can let you down at the worst of times. But Jesus never lets you down. Technology can mess up and be real awkward, but when Jesus swept, sweeps in, miracles can happen. So we are not built on technology. Thank God for all of it. Got a note from a guy just the other week. He said, I was delivered from drug addiction. I'd been a drug addict for years, and I was watching a message, and in the middle of that message, while I was watching a webcast, God delivered me. So I thank God for technology. I thank God for all these men and women that help us get the message online. I thank God for all that. That's wonderful and that's powerful. And I'm amazed by that and it's wonderful. But we're not built on technology. We are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And Jesus Christ himself is still the chief cornerstone. We can have a move of God without technology. But we could start relying on technology and miss a move of God. We can have a move of God without comfort but if we get too comfortable we forfeit the move of God and I remember the stories from that little tiny building down over the hill when they had to bring preachers in around the back because it was so packed God give us a revival like that in a bigger building God give us a revival like that in 2017 God give us a revival like that decades later because we still need to reach a city that's going to hell It would do some of us good to go back and repeat. It would do some of us good to go back and repent. It would do some of us a world of good to go back and remember. Because I see people and I'm horrified at how dead they become over the years. I'm not talking about their emotional response. I'm talking about their carnality level and their worldliness level. It shocks me. It astounds me. It horrifies me. But there's something about a saint of God that there's this constant battle and yes it gets weary sometimes God's pulling you this way and the devil's pulling you this way and the world's pulling you that way and your flesh is pulling you that way but it's worth the fight every day that you live it's worth the fight it's worth the fight to live for God it's worth the fight to do something that matters it's worth the fight to build the kingdom and it's sure worth the fight to go to heaven in the last letter he would ever write on this planet Paul exhorted Timothy, the pastor of the Ephesian church, to make sure that revival never stopped. You see, those three ingredients that John said to Ephesus years later, those are the three key ingredients of every single revival you'll ever see or ever hear about or ever experience. You got to remember, you got to repent, and you've got to go back and repeat. See, we didn't get it wrong the first time. When God filled you with the Holy Ghost, that wasn't just kind of, you know, a little bit of something and now you've got to have something different. You need more of the same. That's what you need. When God brought you into a red hot revival church, he didn't then want you to become calm and cool, cool as a cucumber and just sit it out and wait for the rapture. He wanted you to perpetuate the revival of the church so that others could have the same experience that you had. I don't want to give a generation a washed up, kind of washed out experience that doesn't do for them what it did for us when we came through the doors of the church. I thank God that Jesus is still in the business of breaking the shackles of drug addiction. I thank God that he's still in the business of sobering up an alcoholic not over 20 years but in 20 seconds as the power of the Holy Ghost invades their life. I thank God that Jesus still heals broken bodies, broken lives, broken homes, broken marriages, broken minds. God still is a healer so I don't want to soft soap it and soft sell it and give them something that didn't work for us. We had a red hot 
revival experience and so many of us cut our teeth on services that went a little long and sermons that went a little long and sermons that were a little in your face and we grew up around prayer meetings and worship services that would kind of just make people nervous. I'm not willing to sell that out for something that's kind of sedate. I want the same move of God in my life, in my home, and in this church because that's the only hope of having a move of God like that in this city. So Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, this is the last letter I'm ever going to write to you. I want to put you in remembrance of something. Timothy, you got to stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Timothy, you can't just let it sit there. You can't just let it get dormant. You can't just let it go silent and dark and quiet. Timothy, every once in a while, you've got to take yourself by the lapels and you've got to say, I am going to the altar and heaven help me and hell get out of my way. I am going to break through tonight. I am going to break through this week. I am going to break through in my situation. So devil, I'm here to serve notice on you. This is enough. This is over. I'm going to push through and pray through. Paul said, Timothy, I could write to you about anything. This is the last letter I'll ever write. It's the last correspondence from me. It's like my last will and testament. Let me start out chapter one with this. Timothy, before we get to any other good things, before we get to any other important instructions, here's priority number one. Timothy, keep the gifts stirred up. Timothy, keep the Holy Ghost stirred up. Timothy, keep the prayer and the passion and the power stirred up every once in a while Timothy you're going to have to do something that sounds and looks and acts pretty much insane to the culture around you but the only hope that Ephesus has is a great apostolic church in the middle of that great city the second largest in the Roman Empire so Timothy you better not do church as normal you better not do religion as usual Timothy you better get a hold of yourself and you better stir up the gift what's he talking about the gift of the Holy Ghost that's what he's talking about the ministries that God put in Timothy when he baptized him in the Holy Spirit and so the instruction hasn't changed in 2,000 years you pardon pastor for being a little too intense and a little on edge tonight I'm not mad at anybody I'm really glad about the power of God I'm not frustrated with anybody I'm fascinated by what Jesus is doing around the world but it's my job and it's Pastor Jack's job and it's our leadership's job to stand here and remind us we better get to stirring. Don't stir up the gossip. Stir up the move of God. Don't stir up trouble. Stir up the spirit of God. Don't stir up a bunch of strife. Stir up the Holy Ghost that is in you because this church has a date with destiny before the rapture. This church has a date with destiny before Jesus returns in the clouds and we don't have a long time to get serious about it. So CCC, stir up the gift that is in you. If there's anybody that could get a hand in the air, anybody that could get your voice in the air, anybody that could get your spirit aligned with God's spirit and stir up the gift, stir up the gift. God didn't give you the Holy Ghost so you could die. He didn't give you the Holy Ghost so you could backslide. He didn't give you the Holy Ghost so you could occupy a church pew. He gave you the Holy Ghost so you could stir up the gift that is in you. Uh, I never say this because it doesn't come from our tradition but I wish somebody would make some noise in this room right now and give God some praise and give God a shout of victory and stir up the gift that is in you yes yes it's okay to pray in the spirit it's just us and we're Pentecostal it's okay to talk in tongues that's the gift God gave us 
Every once in a while, no matter your age or stage, every once in a while, no matter whether you're new to Pentecost or you've been around for a while, every once in a while, you just got to stir up the gift. Elders can stir up the gift. Young people can stir up the gift. Married couples can stir up the gift. Single adults can stir up the gift. Little children can stir up the gift. That's why they're getting the Holy Ghost in our Sunday school. So church, stir up the gift that is in you. Would you stand with me tonight? Everybody in the building that can, would you stand with me tonight? And would you lift up your hands? I'm not going to finish the message. We're just going to do this for a bit. Everybody, if you just do whatever you can, I'm not asking you to act like someone else or talk like someone else. I'm not asking you to respond like someone else. But for heaven's sake, stir up the gift that's in you. It's been too long. Stir up the gift that's in you. It's been too long. Stir up the gift that's in you. You deserve to have a Holy Ghost breakthrough before you leave this building tonight. Leaders, if you're part of our team, whatever role you fill, whatever department you're in, whatever class you teach, we need you to get to this altar right now. We need to stir up the gift in all of our leaders and all of our staff. If you're a young person, you need to get to the altar. We need to stir up the gift in our youth group. We don't just need ordinary services on Wednesday night. If you're an adult in this church, if you've got kids in this church, my goodness, we need to stir up the gift. We don't need any more dead Bible studies. We don't need any more ordinary Sundays. We need to stir up the gift. Stir up the gift. Stir up the gift. Stir up the gift. You can't revive something that was never alive. But for almost all the people in this room, we were once alive. We were once on fire. So it should be an easy thing to just remember and go back and repeat and do a little repenting if you have to. But just do that and stir up the gift. This is how we have revival. If you're visiting with us tonight, God can touch your life while this church is praying. God can heal your body while this church is praying. God can deliver you from an addiction while this church is praying. You can receive his spirit into your life while this church is praying in the spirit. Stir it up. Stir it up. Stir up the gift that is in you. Stir up the gift that is in you. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, let the Bokosha Sabaa Soto Rabahete Kesa. If you're anywhere near your spouse, if you're anywhere near a family member, get them by the hand and pray with them. We need to stir up the gift, not just when we're in the church building. We need to stir up the gift in our homes. We need to stir up the gift around our tables. We need to stir up the gift in our families. Stir it up, stir it up, stir it up. No more normal, no more average, no more dead and dry. Stir up the gift that is in you. Stir it up, stir it up, stir it up, stir it up, stir it up. Young couple, you're not like every other average young couple in this city. The devil has no authority over you. He has no right to mess around with you. You need to stir up the gift that is in you. You need to stir up the gift that is in you. You don't need to yield to all the forces that destroy marriage. You don't need to yield to all the pressures of modern culture. You have something special in you. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. So stir up the gift. Your life counts. Your life counts. Your life counts for God. 
Jesus, stir it up. Jesus, stir it up. No more coldness, no more indifference. Stir up the gift. Stir up the gift. Stir up the gift. Sende la basa, no more lukewarm, no more carnal, no more worldly. Stir up the gift. Stir up the gift. No more dabbling in all that junk. Stir up the gift. No more living on the edge and almost falling over the edge. Stir up the gift. Sebere baria to lo korea basieta basa. Somende la bakara bayesa. Eto la bayesa mandela koye. Rebolota la bayesa, batio roko ya basha bati arabosa. Lebolota la bayesa mandela karaboyosa. Ende rebolota la karaboyosa ba. Beto ko yesia saba. Mando la bahari boku shesha ba. Irabolota kala bahaya. In the name of Jesus. Rebolota la balesia seda la boloko ya saba. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. Stir it up. There's giftings in this room. Stir it up. There's callings in this room. Stir it up. There's ministries in this room. Stir it up. It's not your ministry, your gifting, your calling. It only works with the Holy Ghost touching it and anointing it. So stir it up. Stir up the gift that's in you. Stir up the gift that's in you. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. So terabare bari asya sabate rakasha sa, shobare bare terakasha saba. If you need a healing in your body, we're not going to do anything dramatic or weird. I just want you to lift up your hands right now, both hands if you can. If you need a healing in your body, I want you to lift up both hands right now. I'm just going to pray a prayer of healing. Lord Jesus, right now, I thank you, God, for the authority that's in your word. I have no authority to heal anyone, no ability to heal anyone. But God, your word has authority, and your word has ability, and your spirit is here right now. I pray a prayer of healing to sweep through this room. God, I pray a prayer of healing that would be so intense, a wave of your spirit that would be so powerful that it would shrivel and burn up cancer. God, that it would correct the systems of the body, blood pressure and diabetes and all kinds of diseases. I pray that, God, we would receive testimony this week of what you did testimony this week of how it turned around. God, send a wave of your spirit through here. Send a wave of healing. Everywhere the river of revival flows, there's healing in it. There's healing in the waters. 
I curse sickness and disease over God's people. I worship you, Jesus. One more time, can I just get you to reach out to a couple people on either side of you and pray for them, pray with them, pray over them, whatever you feel to do. There's a special anointing on all those young men that are standing over there in the front of the altar. Pray, guys. Pray, guys. This Holy Ghost is on you. God, your word says, I write unto you, young men, because you're strong. God, you're raising up one incredible generation here, and I thank you for it. I thank you for it, Jesus. I thank you for it, Jesus. I thank you for it, Jesus. God, we repent and we remember. And we're going to go back and repeat some of those things. I worship you, Jesus, and I give you praise. I give you praise. I worship you, Jesus. So that I buy your sabbaths. 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 I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I worship you. I worship you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. It's a very common expression today in business, in the business world. You hear it all the time. Great business leaders say it as a reminder to their team that we've got to keep the focus. We've got to keep the main thing the main thing. And in business, they say, vision leaks. So you have to keep kind of going back to the vision of the company or the business. Yeah, vision leaks. filled with the Holy Ghost at the age of 12. I look at some of these kids around this Sunday school and I think I was a late bloomer. And 
And so I've been a vessel for the Holy Ghost for 42 years. That's a long time. Some of you, it's been longer than that. I got to tell you, the Holy Ghost, if you're not careful, it leaks. You can turn around, you can find yourself dry and empty. Let me tell you what else leaks. Passion leaks. You can find yourself getting so preoccupied and distracted. And, and let me tell you something else that leaks that terrifies me. Innocence leaks. We can get so cynical. We know it all. We've been around so long. So every once in a while, we need to repent and remember and repeat the first works. I remember service. We've talked about it off and on over the years. The church that I uh, spent my teenage years in. The building seems so small now. Um, but I remember being in service and one Sunday morning, the song leader, a lady, she was singing and the pastor felt something hit his toe and he looked down and it was her head. She'd been slain out in the spirit, just singing. And before that song service was over, not service, song service, several people had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Some of you grew up in churches around the fringes of New Brunswick. Some of you came from little country churches. And the building wasn't so big or maybe even not so pretty, but there was a group of people there that prayed and knew God. It's precious elders that have gone on to their reward. I don't care who else loses this. If I've got breath in my body and a voice to yell, we're not losing this. We're not losing this. There was a song we sang years ago that just says, let it breathe on me. We don't sing it much anymore. I'd like to sing it tonight. I'd like you to lift your voice and make this a prayer. It's kind of a closing prayer, but it's kind of a commissioning prayer. I want to go out and have one kind of a powerful week this week. Our city deserves it. Your family deserves it. Your colleagues and your neighbors deserve it. Oh my goodness. Before we sing, just lift up that prayer. That's It's just filtering around the edges there. It's so powerful. It just wants out. That's the Holy Ghost in you. Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. I wish you'd forget about everybody else in this building and pray like you were out in a field screaming at the top of your lungs. Lift up that prayer right now to God. There's something about intensity that does what nothing else can do. There's something about determination that makes hell back off. Just one sec. Jesus, right now, I pray. Believe your spirit just quick in me. I pray for everybody in here that it's not just hell that's fighting them. Some of their family members are fighting them. And right now, I pray for them in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would allow them to walk in wisdom. I pray that there would be such an anointing come on them that it confounds the arguments and the pushback. I pray, Lord Jesus, that there would be a great love that would overtake them from your spirit for those people because really they're fighting against themselves. And God, I pray that you would light these precious saints of God that they don't only have to fight hell. They have to fight all the pressure at home. I pray you to light them up like a torch full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom and power and understanding, God. Use them and let the word of the Lord come true, which says, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. I declare it and decree it and claim it. Let 